right, guys, welcome to part two of our heart lecture on Canvas or YouTube for real. All right, so before we move on, we need to review some things about cardiac muscle. All right, so um, quickly think of some things that you know to be true about cardiac muscle. We know that it is voluntary, right? No, it's oops, forgot to change to a pen. It's involuntary. Praise the Lord for that. You don't have to tell your heart to beat. Okay? The fibers are also unique and that they are branched. Noticed that uh, this fiber, you know, there's not even good, there's a little bit of branching shown right there. They are striated. And those striations are caused by the same repeated sarcomeric units that skeletal muscle has. All right. Um, they also are connected by intercalated discs. And like all muscle, of course, it is also excitable. Okay. Excitability is something we're going to review together in class. But excitable cells are cells that can generate an action potential. Um, and respond to stimuli to do so. Mm -hmm. all right, so all neurons and muscle tissue are excitable. So if you come up here, um, I'll switch to the pointer. Come on. All right. Um, here are the intercalated discs. Okay, so this would be one fiber, and you can see a little branching there. All right, so these intercalated discs are... Um, there to allow connection between two neighboring cardiac myocytes and communication between them. All right. In the skeletal muscle, these are not required because every skeletal muscle fiber is super long and connects from tendon to tendon. Cardiac myocytes are different. Um, they are connected to each other by these intercalated discs. So if you zoom in to see what they look like, they have desmosomes, which if you remember from your cell junctions in AMP1 or Bio1, these are like cellular snaps. They legitimately snap the two plasma membranes of adjacent cells together really tightly. Okay, so these are a physical interaction. So as this myocyte contracts and that myocyte contracts, they don't pull apart. All right, they stay together, which allows all of the muscle to contract in a syncytium to offer a, a, a contraction of the full chamber, either the atrium or a ventricle. Okay, gap junctions you should know as well. These are small um, exchange junctions that allow movement of small molecules back and forth. Okay, in this case, they serve as electrical synapses. Um, they also let other things move back and forth, but sodium ions, if this cell is having an action potential, that means sodium is flooding in via um, voltage-gated sodium channels, that sodium and that depolarization can creep into the next cell, as sodium diffuses in here, once this cell depolarizes a threshold, sodium channels will open here, and that will continue to move, so an action potential will move from here to here to here to here, that keeps flying through these electrical synapses in the gap junctions. Okay? All right, so we will review together in class action potentials because it's something that students generally struggle with. So I'm going to assume that we already did that and, and cruise on. So um, just like in smooth muscle and skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle tissue uh, is excitable, and um, they do fire an action potential. Okay? Um, this action potential is initiated by the pacemaker or the SA node, okay, and it spreads to all the working fibers or contractile fibers, which is the majority of the myocardial cells, okay? An action potential in cardiac tissue has three phases, all right? There's a depolarization, so if you recall, depolarization is when a cell depolarizes, it becomes less polarized or less negative, otherwise known as more positive, okay? Remember, resting memory potential in these cells, it's about minus 90 millivolts, so it goes to maybe plus... 30 millivolts, that's depolarization, okay? There's a plateau phase, which is also unique um, to this type of muscle. You don't see that in neurons, and I think we went over this together in class. And then finally, you repolarize, and you bring back to resting memory potential, okay? So if I were to draw this out, uh, let's see, we'll go with green this time because it's fun, okay? We will have our depolarization, which is where we go up, 
and then we have a plateau phase, and then we repolarize. Okay, that is for a cardiac myocyte, the working fibers. And a neuron, okay, you usually have the depolarization, repolarization. No plateau. And that plateau is super important for how heart functions, and we're going to go over that in a second. And you know that I like fun facts. So the depolarization time for a neuron, depol time for a neuron acts potential is 0 0.001 seconds, okay? The time that cardiac myocytes are depolarized, oops, depolarization time is 0 0.25 seconds. That doesn't sound like a lot, but there's a big difference between 0.25 seconds and 0 0.001 seconds. This allows for this plateau to occur um, which again, you'll figure out why that's important for cardiac function. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Here we go. All right. So back to the pointer. All right. So here we are. Um, again, resting memory potential, which is the cell is normally negative 90 millivolts inside compared to the outside of the cell. All right. Upon... Um, a threshold stimulus where enough sodium comes into the cell to reach a threshold voltage gated sodium channels open okay and we have this full depolarization so this is due to sodium uh, coming in to the cell so we're going to pretend that the underside that all of this, that inside of this is inside the cell, and this is outside of the cell, just for the purposes of this discussion. But of course, this graph is showing you the electrical um, signal, not actual ion movements. Okay? So, oops. All right. So, this is depolarization, right? So, then we have this plateau or sustained depolarization. Now, this occurs because we have. Um, Potassium channels uh, that open, and normally potassium goes which way? There's more potassium inside, so potassium is going to leave, okay? But if that was the only thing that was happening, we would repolarize quickly. But at the same time, we have calcium channels opening, and calcium is flooding into the cardiac muscle cell, okay? So what does calcium do when it's inside of a muscle cell? Um, either skeletal muscle or cardiac myocyte. Yeah, it triggers contraction, so it binds to troponin, moves tropomyosin, allows cross-bridging to occur, and power strokes, so we shorten the sarcomeres, shorten the cardiac myocyte, contract the chamber, okay? So as a muscle cell gets excited, as an action potential occurs inside of a muscle cell, this triggers calcium entry, which triggers a contraction. Okay, so... Um, at a certain point in time, <clears throat> see if I can turn this on to this, the calcium channels will shut off, and then more potassium channels open, so more potassium is leaving, so as positive charges leave, that makes the cell more negative, and we cruise down, and we are repolarizing, okay? So now that's how a cardiac action potential looks, all right? So why is this happening? So if you guys recall, a refractory period is a period of resistance to a second or another action potential, okay? So it's a period of resistance for another action potential to occur, all right? So if you look, the refractory period is longer than the depolarization period, okay? You guys see that? So what happens is, as depolarization ends, we start to repolarize. So during repolarization, what is going on? We're repolarizing. That means we are relaxing. Okay. As um, potassium or as calcium entry stops and calcium gets kicked back out, so this is going to be kicked back out of the cell. Um, we're going to start to relax. So we can't fire a new action potential till right about here. So what does this mean? 
This means that because this refractory period is so long, here's the contraction time. We stop contracting before we can stimulate another contraction. Why? Because we do not want no sustained contraction. How do we say sustained contraction? No tetanus. We do this all the time in skeletal muscle. That's cool. It's nice for you to hold your head up and stuff and stand. Okay? But if your heart contracts and keeps contracting, you die. So it is energetically impossible for cardiac muscle, if everything's working properly, to stay contracted. It must contract and then immediately start to relax right there. For the next two slides, I'm going to say most of what I just said in words. So you can pause it here if you want to read it. I'm just going to keep on cruising. All right. Um, this is the point that I already hit, um, but here it is again. The refractory period is a time interval where a second contraction can't be triggered because an action potential is inhibited. Okay? So um, the refractory period, again, is longer than the actual contraction. Therefore, we start to relax before we can trigger another contraction, which allows for proper cardiac function where we contract, relax, contract, relax. Okay, so now we're going to move to the concept of autorhythmic fibers. Um, auto means self, right? So fibers is another way to say muscle. Autorhythmic fibers are specialized cardiac myocytes. Okay, so these are only a certain set that can, they are self-excitable, so they can... They can generate an action potential on own, okay? They don't need a stimulus. They can just go ahead and say, I'm going to fire an action potential, whoop, and they do it, okay? So why are they important? So this is, just so you know, um, uh, about 1% or less of the fibers. Okay, um, so these form what's called the conduction system, which I think I was supposed to write below, but that's okay. So they act as the pacemakers, and they form what I just wrote, the conduction system. Okay. So the conduction system is a system of autorhythmic fibers that control the path of action potential through the heart. Okay? These are a system of these special fibers that control the path and speed sometimes of the action potential as it moves through the heart. Okay? All right. So let's take a look at this conduction in a second here. All right, I'm going to change to another color because it's fun. All right. So here we are. By now you um, know these things, a lot of these structures that are in here. All right. So the main pacemaker of the heart is right here. It's called the sinoatrial node or SA node. Okay? This is the master pacemaker, right? If it sets the pace, all the other autorhythmic fibers shown in the dark red just follow along with him, okay? So what happens is, is the SA node depolarizes, and that depolarization will spread via gap junctions to all the neighboring myocytes through the right atrium, through the left atrium. All of the atrial myocytes depolarize, therefore calcium enters, which leads to contraction. So this leads to atrial systole, okay? So the action potential will travel, and at some point here, at the, the base of the atrium, close to the interventriculum, or the atrial ventricular septum, you have the atrial ventricular, or AV node. That's right here, okay? So at the AV node, and as it travels here, there's a slowing down of the action potential. They're usually really fast, if you recall, from AMP1. They're lightning speed communication, but there's some physiological change here, likely not a lot of voltage-gated sodium channels, that slows down the signal enough so that after contraction, the atrial cells can relax, 
And then that signal can go via the next part, which is the AV bundle or bundle of hiss. That breaks off into the left and right bundle branches. And that signal will travel, oops, down, and then up into the large Purkinje fibers, uh, delivering that actual potential wave of depolarization into the myocardium of the ventricles. Okay, so now once they get that depolarization, calcium enters and the ventricles start to contract and go into systole. Okay, so all of that again is in words right here, which we can happily skip. Uh, now, here is a, um, a video I'm unable to play. So what I'm going to do is find a way to attach this to something else and throw it up there. Um, if not, go ahead and search for an animation or I'll show you just in class this animation on its own. Okay, so again, the conduction system is a series of these autorhythmic fibers that help deliver the, um, the electrical signal from the pacemaker through the heart so that the atria contract and relax and the ventricles contract and relax. And just to recall, um, there is an insulating layer of that fibrous skeleton that insulates the atria from the ventricles. So if this atrial cell is excited, it doesn't excite the guy in the ventricles because you don't want these guys contracting at the same time. So no electrical signal can pass except for right here. Okay, so this conduction system is the one place where the electrical signal or action potential can travel from the atria down into the ventricles. This allows for controlled and um, proper timing of contraction and relaxation of the atria and the ventricles. All right, so again, the SA node is your natural pacemaker. If it was left to its own devices, you would have a heart rate of 100 times a minute, 100 beats per minute, okay? Obviously, that's not how it always is. You should know by now that what system helps regulate this? Your autonomic nervous system. So you can either speed up or slow down your heart rate with um, the autonomic um system. So what would happen if you had sympathetic input? Sympathetic input would lead to an increase in the depolarization rate and heart rate. Parasympathetic, of course, lead to a decrease in heart rate. All right, so what happens if your SA node is trashed? You have a myocardial infarction. That part is gone. Um, Uh-oh. Well, all of those fibers of this whole conduction system are autorhythmic. So if the AV node is no longer getting direction from the SA node, the AV node can take over, although it's not as fast. It could only generate a maximum of 60 beats per minute. Now, this is not very fast. So if your, a if your SA node goes, you're not going to die, but you're going to feel like crap. <laughs> okay. Um, this will allow you to seek medical attention. Okay. Um, and then an intervention usually is going to occur with a pacemaker where there's a artificial electrical stimulus delivered to the atrium or right into the ventricles themselves to allow for proper contraction and um, rate, which also can be, um, now they're fancy, they can actually change with your activity level and everything is pretty cool. Uh, if your AV node is gone too, you're pretty much done because the other like bundle of hiss and Purkinje fibers can only do 20 to 30 beats a minute and you're not going to live very long at that pace. Okay, and here's a, an x-ray of this. All right, again, so your main heart rate um, is set by the pacemaker, but that can be modulated through the ANS, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, and, of course, some hormones can do that, too. Okay, so that's where we So timing and strength of contraction is altered by the ANS, and hormones. All right. Uh, acetylcholine can slow the heart rate to 75 beats per minute. Okay. Who releases acetylcholine at the effector? A uh, parasympathetic nervous system. If you remember so sympathetic postganglionic neurons secrete acetylcholine. At, in this case, the effector would be the pacemaking cells um, to slow the heart rate of the SA node. Epinephrine is released by the sympathetic nervous system, okay, and that will lead to an increase in heart rate, but neither of them, if your SA node is toast, 
no amount of epinephrine will raise your heart rate. The essay node has to be pacemaking on its own for it to be modified at all. Okay, so now we talked about this electrical system and how it helps establish the rhythm and contraction of the heart. Um, so now how do we measure this? an electrocardiogram. So you recall last semester you guys did a um, um, muscle myography or electromyography um, or an EMG and dynamometry on skeletal muscle. So an EKG or an ECG is basically the same thing. It's a composite record of the actual potentials and electrical signals produced by all the heart fibers or muscle fibers. Okay? As three recognizable waves, you have the Q wave, oops, P wave first, <laughs> QRS complex, and the T wave. All right? Um, and they all have different things. Again, this is an electrical reading. This is not showing contraction. You can infer contraction and relaxation based on what you know about what's happening electrically. Okay? So, this is taking a long time to change. For fun, I want to change the pointer. Ooh, I can use this. Hey, I changed it to Star Wars. That's kind of fun. Okay, so here is the P wave. Eh, that's kind of annoying. Okay, so here <laughs> is the P wave. Okay? The P wave is the change in... Um, this reading from all the electrode leads on the body that indicates uh, atrial depolarization, which is not written here. Okay, so the P wave is when the atria depolarize. Now remember, depolarize is when they go less negative. That's when sodium enters the cell, and recall in cardiac myocytes, when depolarization occurs, calcium channels open, calcium floods in the cell, triggering contraction. Okay, so you can infer that when the atria depolarize, that contraction is going to begin, and so that's why atrial uh, contraction shown here in the blue bar is occurring shortly after the P wave. Okay, so the next thing we have is this QRS um, wave signal. This is when um, the atria now need to repolarize. So the repolarization is when calcium channels turn off, Potassium channels continue to open, and potassium leaves the cell, allowing it to go back down to negative resting membrane potential, and relaxation occurs in the atria. At the same time, the ventricles depolarize. Okay, so as they depolarize, that means the same thing. Sodium flux triggers an action potential. Um, sodium channels open. Now there's an influx of sodium. Calcium channels are open because they're voltage sensitive. Voltage floods in, or calcium floods in, triggering contraction. So ventricular systole, or contraction, show, is shown starting at just the beginning of that QRS wave. Okay, so now we have the ventricles depolarized. Now we need to do what to them? So here's a T wave. This is where, of course, what the ventricles repolarize. So they go back down to resting membrane potential. The calcium channels close, more potassium channels open. All right, so this graph is not like um, other ones where it's more positive and more negative here. That's just not how it works. It's more complicated than that. I want you to be able to tell me exactly what this graph means and then what you can infer from this graph, okay? So at the end of the T wave, all the way to the beginning of the next P wave, that is the relaxation period where no one is contracting. Everyone's in diastole. And that's also what is shortened most um, during an increase. So I think I gave you too much on that slide because here's everything again. So all the things that I just said are right there. Cool. So you can read that again if you'd like. <laughs> all right. And so now we're going to go through this one more time. But with that, I think that's a great way um, to see what's going on here. All right. So notice, I'm going to switch back to my pointer here. Okay, so in this series of graphs, yellow means depolarized. So what does depolarized mean? That means it's going um, positive, in the positive direction. 
repolarization means is going back negative. And now we're talking about that rest, the membrane potential itself, okay? Because all that's happening with an action potential is a change in membrane potential. All right, so, so during the P wave, we know the atria depolarize. So you see the SA node fires an action potential, and that action potential mm -hmm. travels through all the gap junctions and those intercalated discs. And that wave of depolarization is traveling, and that causes this blip on the actual ECG trace. Okay. So now once the P wave is done, you can notice the whole um, atria are all depolarized, which means those cells have calcium in them. So we can infer from that information that these um, myocytes are all contracting. Atrial systole is occurring. All right. So now... Um, that's just after the P wave. So now, as we enter the QRS complex, notice that our um, cardiac myocytes up here in the atria are starting to repolarize, so they're going to relax, because the red means repolarize, so they're going back to negative. And recall that that action potential is now traveling down through the conduction system, bundle of His, bundle branches, Purkinje fibers, and now the um, apex of the ventricles is starting to depolarize during this QRX complex. Time we get past this QRS complex, the whole of the ventricles are depolarized, which means if you were on a, a, drawing an action potential, these cells are up in this part of the action potential itself. Okay, so this drawing is of one cell, this is of all cells. Okay, be able to differentiate those two from each other. All right, so now that we know that, that means these cells have an influx of calcium and the ventricles are doing systole, they're contracting right now. All right, so now we're going to move to the T wave. All right, so now these cells have depolarized, now they're going to quickly, you know, repolarize after that plateau phase is over. So these cells are starting to repolarize and relax, and that wave of repolarization will sweep over the whole thing. And now we are in the relaxation period where no one is contracting, everyone is relaxed. is a look at an ECG trace. Okay, this is a normal sign. So this is a what wave? That is, well, let's see this one instead. That is a, oh, that's T wave, isn't it? P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. So this is one heartbeat cycle. So why do we do these? Uh, you can see a lot of things on an ECG trace from potential heart attacks. You can see when there's a conduction system issue. So now let's look at this one. Take a peek and think about what's missing. What's missing? What's missing is the P wave. So there's a QRS and a T, but there's no P. So what does that mean? SA node's probably gone, okay, so this heart rate's going to be a little bit slower because now the AV node is setting the pace, so that's a nodal rhythm. That's an example of how this can be used. Alright, so now is where we put all that we've covered into one big picture called the cardiac cycle. Okay, so these are every single thing that occurs with one heartbeat. All right, so during atrial systole, the ventricles are what? You should be able to fill this out on your own now. Systole means what? So the atria are in systole, the ventricles are in diastole, so therefore they are relaxed. Okay, that's not a Y, it's an X. Okay, now during ventricular systole, the atria are relaxed. Okay, never ever should your um, atria and ventricles be contracted at the same time. That's the whole point of having that insulation layer there to control when the action potential crosses that atrial ventricular barrier. Okay. The contractions will help force blood to move from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure, okay, which is based on all the, the valve movements that we talked about in part one, all right? 
A relaxation period is something you have to find for you already, but the relaxation period is a period of time when both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed. So that's between the what? So in the in the um, ECG trace, that's from what to what? The end of T to the beginning of the P wave. Okay? Um, when you increase your heart rate, Mostly, the relax relaxation period is what's shortened. Um, this sort of kind of rest time, and very little of the diastole or the systole changes um, actually occur, because that's when the actual pumping is occurring, which is you know kind of important. Okay, so uh, here is another this version that I'm presenting to you. I can't do. So this is something else again. I will show you in class, hopefully after you've watched this to kind of help kind of solidify all these concepts and take them home, which I'll do this with this as well, but I'm going to go ahead and try to go over this. Okay, so this is a big concept picture, but if you've put things together piece by piece by piece, this should just make sense. Okay, so in this picture, at the top we have an ECG trace. So this is a measure of what? the measure of the electrical signals or action potentials as they travel through one heartbeat and then beginning another one, okay? Uh, notice that the blue boxes all, are all contingent on the same amount of time. This is the same timing, same time, same time, okay? Uh, in this B graph, this is a measure of pressure, and this happens to be pressure in the left, uh, in, the, in the heart, um, on the left side, okay? So if you look here, the red line is the pressure in the aorta. So this is the aortic, basically, blood pressure. All right? The blue line is left ventricular pressure. So this is the blood pressure, the pressure of the blood inside the ventricle itself. The green line here is left atrial pressure. Okay? Um, so all these things, depending on what's going on electrically, will change as um, contraction and relaxation occurs. For now, we're going to skip heart sounds, okay? You can learn that somewhere else. Um, now we're going to move down to D. This is the volume in the ventricle, okay? Um, so this will show you uh, the blood volume changes, which you can infer based on what's happening above, all right? And then you guys can put the phase of the cardiac cycle here with all of it on your own. So let's start back up here, okay? So <clears throat> we know that uh, right before the P wave occurs, we're relaxing, and so likely the pressure in the atria is greater than the ventricle, and so blood's going to be filling the ventricle, correct? So, P wave occurs, um, the atria start to contract, and um, blood is flowing into the ventricle. All right, so at that time, you should see blood volume rising. Okay, we've been filling in here, now it's going to rise even more. Okay, atria depolarized, which means atrial systole. <coughs> So during this time, notice that the atrial pressure is higher than the ventricular pressure, which means what valve is open? The mitral or bicuspid valve is open because the pressure in the atrium is greater than the pressure in the ventricle. So those cusps are pushed in, and as blood comes back to the atrium, it fills into the ventricle. Okay? Come back up to the um, ECG trace. During the QRS complex, what happens? The ventricle myocytes depolarize, okay? So as they depolarize, that leads to contraction or ventricular systole. So as the ventricles contract, what should happen to the ventricular pressure? Well, it should go up. So as the ventricular pressure is higher than the atrial pressure, what just happened? The bicuspid and mitral valve closed because now the pressure in the ventricles higher than the atrium. So papillary muscles contracted, we pulled in the heartstrings, blood pushed those cusps up, and now the pressure rises in the ventricle, okay? But no other valve is open yet, so the volume is not changing, okay? Now what valve is going to open? The aortic valve, but only when the pressure of the ventricle is higher than the aortic pressure. So as soon as a blue line, the pressure in the ventricle exceeds that of the pressure in the aorta, the aortic valve opens, okay? So as the aortic valve opens, 
what should happen? Blood is being what? Pushed out in the aorta. Okay? So what should happen to the volume? The volume in the ventricle should go down. Yes, it does. All right. So back up to the ECG trace. Now we're done with the depolarization. Now we're going to start repolarization. So as we repolarize, what happens? We go into ventricular diastole. So the ventricle starts to relax. And when the pressure in the ventricle is lower than the aorta, what happens? The aortic valve closes. Okay? So now the aortic valve is closed. There should be no volume change. Right? So volume staying the same. So the pressure falls, 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 falls. And when the pressure in the ventricle falls below that of the atrium, which is in green, what happens? The mitral valve reopens because the pressure in the atria is greater than the pressure in the ventricle. So when that occurs, the volume is going to start to rise until we get to the next P wave and we start it all over again. So we're going to go over this again probably in class, but those are all the things that are occurring all at the same time in the left part of the heart. Now a very similar series of graphs um, can occur in the right side of course. The pressure won't be as great. Um, and I want you to think about why. Why would the pressure not need to be as high in the left and the right side of the heart versus the right? Okay, something to think about. That also leads to why one chamber is thicker than the other one. Okay? We're going to skip this. All right, so now we're moving to cardiac output. So now we're going to put some math-ish a little bit in, or some equations. Thinking about this. So there's a few... Um, symbols and terms that we need to learn. So SV stands for, I need my pen again, stroke volume, right, which is literally the milliliters or volume of blood ejected per beat with one stroke, one contraction, okay? Cardiac output is the milliliters, or volume, ejected per minute. So that's the rate. So how do we determine cardiac output? We can take the stroke volume times what? Think about it a second. Times the heart rate, number of strokes per minute, amount of volume leaving per minute, you multiply those, that gives you the total cardiac output. So that's, cardiac output is how much blood is pumped out of a ventricle per unit time, okay? So typically, as you guys are sitting somewhere, uh, you guys especially, the four of you in the class, haha, um, it's about a little over, a, the, five, more than five liters per minute. That's kind of a lot. Five liters of blood, think about two two liter bottles of soda plus a one liter. That total volume per minute is leaving when you're just chilling. Okay? Um, but that can obviously change. All right? Uh, another fun fact. All of your blood goes through both your pulmonary and your systemic circulations each minute. That's amazing. That's why you can die pretty fast if you have an arterial bleed. Okay? So our blood cell hairy. He gets to make the whole trip through the whole system every minute. That's pretty crazy. That's a lot of rides through the roller coaster of the circulatory system. All right, so obviously we're not done, right? Cardiac output, do you think it stays the same all the time? Of course not. When you're sleeping, your cardiac output needs to be significantly less than when you're running or chasing, you know, running on a treadmill or whatever you're doing, okay? So now we need to think about how do we regulate stroke volume. Okay. So the left and right ventricles, I think I told you this before, pump about the same volume. So every time the ventricles contract, relatively the same volume is being ejected from the right and left ventricles. So the same amount of blood is going into the pulmonary trunk as is going into the aorta every time. Okay, and three factors regulate stroke volume. 
okay? And they are called preload, contractility, and afterload. All right. So we're going to go through these, each one individually, uh, and discuss how that affects your stroke volume. Again, what is stroke volume? That is the volume leaving per stroke, per contraction, per heartbeat. Okay, so we're going to start with preload first. Okay, so this is preload, okay? Contractility, okay? Contractility is defined as the strength of contraction at a given preload. So the strength of contraction at a um, given preload, 
Okay, so if preload is not changing, you can change the strength of contraction, okay? And so there's two types of agents that can modulate contractility. There are positive and negative, what are called inotropic agents, okay? Positive ionotropic agents, guess what they do to the contractility? They increase contractility. All right? So these agents can, like epinephrine, can increase or help calcium inflow during the action potential. So remember, during the plateau phase, calcium floods in. These agents can increase the amount of calcium that comes in. You have more calcium coming in, more cross bridges, greater strength of contraction, okay? So this would increase the stroke volume because we're contracting harder, okay? Negative ionotropic agents would do the opposite, okay? These, of course, would decrease contractility. Things that will do that are anoxia, which is um, low oxygen or blood flow, acidosis, um, some anesthetics, increase potassium and inertial fluid and calcium channel blockers okay i want you to think about this question and maybe we'll go over it in class i want you to think about that on your own okay so nectar load this one is the most difficult conceptually and uh, i think i'll hit this with you in, in person but i'll go through it here anyway so after load is defined as the pressure that must be overcome. So pressure that must be be overcome. Oops. Before a semilunar valve opens. Okay, so who are the semilunar valves? That is the aortic and pulmonary valves. Okay, so this is legitimately the aortic blood pressure and the pulmonary trunk blood pressure. So this is based on the, the blood pressure in the aorta blood pressure in the pulmonary trunk. That's actually what afterload is, okay? So if you increase afterload, what happens to stroke volume, all right? So afterload um, is this. So let's say you had um, aortic pressure. So we'll say aortic pressure was 120 millimeters of mercury, okay? And something happened to increase this to 125. Okay. So what would happen to stroke volume? Right? So if the afterload, this is the pressure in the aorta. So this is the BP in the aorta. Okay, aortic pressure. So remember the cardiac cycle. So would it take longer or shorter to open the aortic valve when you increase the pressure in the aorta? I want you to think about that. In fact, pause it a second until you think of an answer. Don't just keep going because it won't be good for your development here and understanding. I'm assuming you paused and came up with an answer now. Okay. So if the pressure goes up, that means the ventricle has to contract a little bit longer to reach this pressure before the aortic valve opens. Therefore, the aortic valve is going to be open less time. So an increase in the afterload causes stroke volume to decrease. Okay? Um, which sometimes will leave uh, extra blood in the ventricle at the end of systole because it didn't get out. Okay? Things that can increase afterload is obviously hypertension. This means high blood pressure, if you don't know that already. And atherosclerosis is plaques which decrease the lumen size, basically, which increase pressure in the aorta. Okay, so let's, uh, here we are. So effects on stroke volume. So if you increase preload, remember it's the degree of stretch on the heart, what happens to stroke volume? It increases stroke volume. So 
The more blood fills during diastole into the ventricle, the greater the stretch on the chamber. The more the chamber stretches, the greater the force of contraction. Therefore, more blood is ejected per beat, which is stroke volume. Okay? If you increase contractility or the force of contraction, that, of course, would also increase the amount of blood leaving. Right? If you increase the afterload or the pressure in either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta, this would decrease the amount of stroke volume. And I think there's not much left, but it's pretty late on Sunday. I will record part three, which will be shorter, tomorrow. At least you will have these two, hopefully, tonight. Um, 